Good evening, everyone. A warm welcome to the Winwood Art Talks. My name is Colette Mello, and it's my pleasure to be organizing this event. Today, we have a special guest with us, Lauren Shapiro. Lauren Shapiro is an artist and educator who's well known for her unique artworks, which blend ceramics with technology to draw attention to the fragile ecosystem of South Florida and beyond. Her artworks have been showcased in prestigious venues such as the Bakehouse Art Complex, the Jewish Museum of Florida, Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden, and Green Space. She's been recognized with various grants and residencies, including the Wave Maker, Night's Art Challenge, No Vacancy, Home and Away, and Lab Verde. Lauren Shapiro completed her MFA in ceramics from the University of Miami and has taught at the New World School of the Arts and Florida International University. We are grateful to have her here today. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and welcome everybody. Thanks for tuning in to my artist talk. Uh, I'm going to take you through my practice. Sometimes uh, I think it's really helpful to, for people to see where I've come from and where I am now, um, kind of helps figure out how you bridge that gap. So I'm gonna share my screen and share some visuals with you all. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of context uh, behind what it is that I do. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, super. So I am a Floridian. I was born and raised in South Florida and mostly Broward County is where I lived. And um, I've been here my whole life. So my work is deeply influenced by the environment of Florida, which is a really unique uh, set of ecologies between the Everglades and the ocean and the Pine Rockland and a mixture of tropical and temperate plants as well as marine life. And I don't think I really realized how much that influenced me until later on after I got out of grad school. But I'm going to take you through my process through my MFA at UM, where I learned how to become a master mold maker, some of the residencies that I've done and completed that influenced my work, and then how I've begun to weave in technology into my material practice. Um, so I started my MFA at UM in 2012, and I was really interested in learning about mold making for preserving ephemeral objects. And my focus was mostly on paper. So I spent a lot of time, uh, I had an avid origami practice. It was a way that I would manage my anxiety and stress relief by folding repetitively thousands of origamis. And there's a famous origami legend um, about a thousand origami cranes. Whoever folds a thousand cranes gets their heart's desire. So I kind of embarked on this practice where I would fold things in a set of a thousand. Uh, so my first semester of grad school, all I did was fold paper. And um, eventually that kind of led into the slip casting of ceramics, which I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with ceramic processes, but slip casting is when you create a mold. So it's like a negative, uh, a void space and then you fill it with clay to make a positive and you can do this for multiples. So this first image is an example of how I was able to turn folded pieces of paper um, that would normally be assembled into a paper airplane or possibly um, folded up into these geometric patterns into porcelain. So these are um, two examples of porcelain cast from paper. Um, here's some examples of what molds look like. On the left-hand side is a library of molds. So in my studio, if you ever come visit me, I'm at the Bakehouse Art Complex and you're welcome to come by. Uh, you'll see a lot of these white sort of bulky objects. Those are molds. They are plaster or gypsum, uh, which is a liquid. It's a powder material that you pour liquid into that solidifies into a hard material. And what that does with ceramic is when you pour liquid clay into the mold, it hardens it into a shell. And then you're able to produce these um, sort of leather hard forms that can either be built or assembled into um, installations or, or just multiples. Here's an example of the first project I did when I was uh, in grad school. This was at the Fat Village Art District in Fort Lauderdale. Um, this was a thousand origami boats. And for me, this was uh, an interesting way to experiment with installation and sort of spatial, sort of immersive installations. So here's uh, a thousand boats that were folded from written notes, letters, mark making, and assembled as if they were flying out of the suitcase. Uh, and that kind of led into the series of objects of geometric forms. So what you see here are individual shapes that are slip cast in molds and then assembled. And for me, I was really interested in the hidden geometries of nature, sort of like when you look at a leaf under a microscope, how you see all these different geometric forms, um, seeking out these connection points. 
I'm fascinated by systems, how things fit together, what causes them to hold together, what causes them to collapse. Uh, and these were sort of formal studies for me in graduate school, exploring these crystalline forms and playing with this idea of balance, repetition, and harmony. Um, here's another series called Fortune Tellers, which are all single slipcast uh, forms that have been assembled into wall installations. So this is kind of derived from that um, the fortune teller game that we have when we're kids that you fold things with, or that you fold, it's a game that you play. These are slipcast forms. They're about seven by seven diameter inches and about four inches in height. Um, one of the main things that really influenced me in grad school in 2015, I was able to do a residency in uh, Southeast China in a town called Jindazhen. And Jindazhen is where Ai Weiwei, the famous uh, Chinese artist, political activist, uh, completed his sunflower seed project, where he produces a lot of his um, installation work with ceramics. And what makes Jindazhen so special, it's the porcelain capital of the world. So I learned about production. And in China, not everybody has, not everybody does everything. So there, it's a production, uh, a production town. So there's one person that slip casts. There's one person that makes all the molds. There's one person that fires all the kilns. That one, there's one person that paints the decals and they're really, really good at it. And there's just factories of production. And so that really got me thinking about production um, and how you can sort of have an idea and then collaboratively work with other people to execute that idea, which really has informed a lot of the work that I'm doing now. Uh, here's one of my sculptures that I completed for my thesis and my MFA. Uh, it's called Genesis. And so it's a sculptural sort of form that I hand built the base and attached all these slip cast elements to with hanging porcelain forms that are either floating away or, or um, ascending whatever way that you see them. Um, and then I was also working a lot with installation in terms of photography, playing with this idea of porcelain geometry as landscape and different ways of like arranging positive and negative space. Um, and I also included some projection work because uh, most recently I just, I started working again with projections. I was really fascinated by how these different forms create picture planes. And here I was projecting videos of um, sunrise, sunset, time lapses, clouds rolling over these forms. Um, to create these objects are sort of like a, they call it fidgetal. So it's physical and digital where it's a physical object that holds a digital uh, asset. And so these are different types of examples of projections that I was experimenting with um, several years ago. It also led the way into different types of immersive work uh, using digital with uh, material. So these are different, two different sculptures that were featured in Miami. One was called I think it was the, uh, was it called raw pop-up at the Moore building in the design district? Another one was at the historical post office downtown. And these are different types of ceramic forms. On the left-hand side, it's actually concrete cast blocks projected on top of a printed mirror uh, to experiment with more experiential works that sort of draw you in. Uh, I've also done collaborative projects. This is a piece I did with another artist, Magnus Sodeman, who's uh, a well-known Miami painter. He paints these beautiful expressionistic landscapes. Uh, and for me, I really feel like collaboratively working with other artists has been so rewarding because it pushes you to do things that you normally wouldn't do. Like for me, I was doing a lot of monochrome uh, kind of types of palettes and Magnus is very colorful with his work. So we did this sort of immersive, crazy party table called Table of Delights, where it's my my uh, ceramic uh, forms with fake flowers and a painted canvas and candles. And we did this for a one night pop-up exhibition downtown at the abandoned Payless shoe store. Uh, and so this was kind of like a tableau. So this kind of led me into thinking more about when I got out of grad school, I really wanted to think about um, what are some of the issues that people are discussing here in Miami? And I noticed that a lot of the artists that were doing really well here all had something to say. And I think when you're in school and you're studying, you're really focusing on um, what you're about, what kind of work that you want to make, where are you drawing from history? And it becomes very academic. Um, and for me, that was a way to understand art history, the people that have come before me, understand how to manipulate the material and master my craft. Um, but when I got out, I wanted to turn that vocabulary and onto the onto the landscape of Miami and think about what what are the issues that I really want to talk about? What do I really want to draw attention to in Miami? And I think we all noticed, especially recently with the crazy flooding that's been happening in the last like five, six, seven years, even more recently in the last two, three years, that sea level rise is going to become a problem here in Miami. 
that the that the idea of like land and sea are sort of blurring a little bit. And I'm really fascinated by human relationships with nature, how we can, uh, how we're very innovative, how we can come up with different types of problem solving, uh, but also to draw awareness to these different types of issues, what's causing uh, climate change. Uh, and so this is a project I did in 2017 that started to explore these themes. Uh, this one's called Garden House. This was at the downtown historical post office. So it was a beautiful raw space and artists were invited to participate in a group show. And I wanted to create something that I spent so much time in grad school trying to prevent things from falling apart or cracking and making them permanent that I wanted to create something that was impermanent. And so what this project was is I wrapped this concrete column with unfired clay textures. And all of the textures were made from molds of different types of endangered plants, native plants, invasive plants based in Miami. Um, that were pressed into silicone molds and attached to a framework. Um, and what was so interesting about this project, and it kind of led me into more of a social practice in my work involving the community to build them, because we basically had two days to build this installation that was our install time, and it takes a really long time to cover, cover these structures with clay. And so I invited some students and friends and different artists in the community to come help me. And what I found was really interesting. The people that came to participate really loved it. Like they kept asking me, do you need help with more? Can I come back? I enjoyed that so much. And, you know, I've been an educator. I've been a teacher with ceramics and I know how like attractive the material is, how malleable it is. And I thought there's something to this, this idea of like collaboratively building a work of art that ultimately is going to get destroyed. Like, what does that mean? What does that mean to put so much effort and energy into something only to have it destroyed instantly a week, a couple of days later? And I thought that might be a really interesting way to talk about the issues that are threatening our environment. Um, and so I wanted to learn a little bit more about plant ecology. And I thought, what better place to do that than in the Amazon rainforest of Brazil? It's one of the most amazing um, treasures of the world where life cycles are rapid, right? Things are growing, things are dying. There's species of plants and animals and, and insects that exist in the Amazon that we don't even know about. And it's it's being threatened by deforestation and all sorts of problems. And the rainforest itself is like the lungs of the world, right? So when that goes down, what happens to the rest of us? And with my interest in systems, I thought it might be a really interesting place to start. So I applied in 2018 to a residency called Lab Verde, this is in Manaus, Brazil, it's in Northern Brazil. Um, and I was accepted. So they chose, I think 13 or 14 of us from around the world, all with different practices to uh, come together for 10 days on the Amazon uh, and hear from scientists, present our work, listen to research, explore the, explore the, um, explore the trees, explore the rainforest and, and create a project when we got back. And so my idea was to basically go out there and learn and observe and meet other artists working in this field and take silicone molds of different types of leaves and, and plants that I was most interested in. And so on the bottom left, those purple sort of like spongy things are the silicone molds that I use to make uh, the ceramics. And when I returned, I built this piece. Um, it's a circle shape to represent the life and death cycles that I noticed in the Amazon and how rapid it was like for one, for an example, walking on a path, there was a giant moth, right. And it was dead. And by the time I got back an hour and a half later, two hours later, it was mostly gone from other insects that had consumed it and eat it and ate it. Right. So it happens that quickly. It's very, very fertile place. And so I made this, uh, unfired clay wheel on my wall to talk about the fragility of the Amazon. As you can see on the right-hand side, it cracks and, and breaks. And that can actually stay on the wall until it's disturbed by water or people, which is uh, kind of a metaphor as to what's happening here in Miami with, with sea level rise. And then that kind of um, branched into a lot of experiments with different types of work, fusing these geometric forms with organic textures cast from nature to talk about these different types of systems. Uh, here's an example of a wall piece. Uh, called Sacred Amazonas, which is inspired by my time in the Amazon. These are all porcelain shapes and leaves cast from the Amazon, uh, as well as different types of objects that I was creating to talk about these different systems, balance, and how things are being held together. So you can see some are geometric, some, are, some have leaves and different types of organic shapes. And then in 2019, I applied to a grant called the Wavemaker Grant, which is offered through Locust Projects. If any of you are artists, I highly recommend. The deadline just passed, but they offer it every year for uh, new interesting ideas that incorporate the community. 
And based on my past experiences involving people to help me build these installations, um, one of my dreams was to do a project with Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden. It's one of the most amazing treasures of Miami. It's basically an art installation of plants that have been curated here for, for, for decades. And so my idea was to go into the garden and use silicone to cast different types of plants, talk to the scientists, learn about their research, learn about the ecology here in South Florida. How do these plants get here? Um, who brought them here and and what are the different types of plants that that exist here and what are the threats that are facing them um, and what i found is um here, well, here's some examples of the process of casting some of the molds so fairchild uh let me into their garden they introduced me to their scientists they let me slap silicone on different types of plants and, and cast different textures and what i learned was that a lot of the plants that are here in south florida do not come from south florida most of them were brought here and because florida's climate is so conducive to different types of growth. There are plants that exist here from South America, from the Caribbean. There are plants that exist here from North America, even further up beyond our state. And it's like, uh, Jen Fields is a really well-known um, botanist that she, we call her Lady of the Fern. And she talks about it as overlapping circles or Venn diagrams of plants. And she wrote a lot of really beautiful essays about this, about how South Florida creates this sort of Venn diagram where different types of plants from different climates can thrive. Um, and so my project was to create a site-specific installation of unfired clay over the entrance of the garden, because to satisfy the Wakemaker grant, it needs to be free and open to the public. And uh, with Fairchild being a ticketed entry, they let me put it at the entrance. So this was up for one week. And over the course of several weeks leading up to that, I taught a series of workshops where people would press clay into the silicone molds of the plants. I would store them in these boxes that kept them moist. And then on the weekend of their garden festival where 5,000 guests were coming through, um, we invited the public to help us attach clay uh, to a framework, a post and lintel framework over the entrance of the garden, kind of like leading you into the garden. Uh, and this was the result. It's called um, Temporary Terrains. And uh, it's sort of, blends in with the lime rock of the, of the building itself, but all of the textures were sourced from the garden. And the project was up for one week before it was uh, taken apart and recycled. So all of these unfired clay installations that I do, uh, it's a low carbon footprint because none of these are fired and all of this clay ends up getting recycled. So it's kind of like, almost like Adobe mud hut building, like smearing clay onto these frameworks that are not necessarily uh, permanent. Um, and for me, this was a really great way to experiment with scale because to do something like this permanent is very expensive. It requires permits and such. Um, but a lot of these projects led the way for me to start doing larger scale public art projects that are permanent. Uh, here's some details of temporary terrains. So with the clay, it will crack on the frame, but as it cracks, it dries and shrinks and the understructure is uh, chicken wire. So when you press it into the framework, it shrinks and holds onto the wire. So that's how, uh, that's my secret trick. Don't tell anybody. Um, so my largest installation to date um, was with a colleague of mine who was actually a friend from childhood. Her name is Nissa Silbiger, now Dr. Nissa Silbiger, who's a very well-known um, marine biologist based out of California State University in Northridge. And the two of us met when we were in Girl Scouts, which is a nerdy fun fact about me. I was a Girl Scout for 10 years. And um, it's really funny because I never thought that, that that would be a big influence on who I am as an artist. But when you spend your weekends doing beach cleanups and snorkeling and like exploring different types of campsites and learning how to make a fire and identifying different seeds, because with Girl Scouts, you have to earn different badges. Um, it really cemented into us like a, a love of nature. And I think both her and I, she went off to become this amazing marine biologist. We hadn't spoken in 25 years. And through social media, she saw a lot of these unfired clay installations that I was doing with the public. And so she was applying to a National Science Foundation grant and she needed some outreach. So with scientists, they have uh, they have to satisfy with the grant outreach, which means they have to be able to communicate their research to the public through either a paper or a lecture. But Nissa, thinking outside of the box, she figured, why don't I write Lauren into this grant and she can do a project with the community to talk about um, my research, which is based in coral reefs. Um, and so we did. So I helped her uh, write an outreach uh, project, which would involve an unfired clay installation with four reefs in the community. And she was funded. She got a, a $1.7 million NSF grant to bring her students to research corals in French Polynesia for three years and a tiny amount for me to do a project. And so 
I started learning a little bit more about marine environments more than before I had just kind of scratched the surface. I was coming from like an ecology plant background. Um, and I was fascinated about this idea of, of coral, coral reefs being the the forests of the sea, right? There, there's all different types of species, just like plants that exist in different regions. One of my first uh, scuba diving expeditions because I wanted to be able to go see these reefs was at this location, it's called Neptune Memorial Reef. This is off the coast of Key Biscayne. Anyone can go if you're scuba certified, it's about 40 feet down. Um, and for me, I'm really interested in architectural forms and integrated spaces, how to integrate like application for architecture with nature. And this is what it looks like. It's also it's also an artificial reef where people who die can be cremated. And I don't know if you see that little clam shell by that guy's fin right there, but that is a human being that's been cremated into a, a concrete form. And then they basically glue it onto the ocean floor and corals and other marine life will grow on top of it. So this idea of this place that is that has like death, but also rebirth was really interesting to me. And so... I started casting uh, silicone molds of coral skeletons. And at the time this was COVID. So I did a giant social practice project during COVID, which was insane, um, but we made it happen. And originally I was supposed to go out to Maria with Nissa, cast her corals in the Pacific, come back and communicate that research. But what happened was a little different. She ended up, uh, because of COVID restrictions, we couldn't travel. So I sourced a lot of these coral skeletons from University of Miami, Florida International University, local coral reef groups. Um, and it really created a lot of enthusiasm in the scientific community locally for the project. So this is kind of like how it works. I made silicone molds of these skeletons. And then over the course of a month, 300 volunteers participated in a construction of this 15,000 pound installation of unfired clay. Uh, and so this is a, a screenshot of a video that we made uh, documenting this process. Uh, and here's the final result. It was called Future Pacific. Future Pacific uh, was a series of architectural forms, post and lintel structures that were sliced um, in two, two parts or three parts and spread throughout the gallery. This was at the Bakehouse Art Complex in their largest gallery. Um, and it was a monumental undertaking. It took uh, a lot of energy and effort to make this work. Um, and it's not permanent. So at the end, all of this clay was uh, destroyed, crushed up and recycled. Um, here's another view. Uh, so when you walked into this room, like imagine it's like, it smells like earth. It smells like clay. Um, there was like a heaviness to it. You like, you're kind of like walking through a graveyard, but when you look, I think what's so remarkable about this project is that you look at every little piece, every single one of those pieces was put on by somebody's hand. So it's an enormous amount of labor. Um, just for something that's going to be basically destroyed. And that was uh, sort of the metaphor of talking about what's happening to uh, coral reefs. Um, and so here's a little bit under the hood of what that looked like. We created a series of architectural structures. Um, I also had a little model. So thinking about planning this exhibition, I made all of these models in cardboard first, arranged them inside of like a mock gallery, which is a really great way to imagine installations in a spatial way. Uh, and then we selected the forms, built them out of wood, covered them with chicken wire, and then um, the workshops, we covered the rest of the structures in clay. A lot of work. Uh, and here's a detail of what one of those forms looked like. So I mixed in different types of mason stains and colors. All of this clay, by the way, was donated from different places. Um, I went to different ceramic studios. People would drop off bags of like hardened clay that they couldn't use anymore. The thing about ceramic is if you don't fire it and you add water, it can be turned back into mud. It could be made soft again. So I spent a good two and a half months reclaiming a lot of this clay. I tried not to buy anything new. One of the local suppliers in St. Petersburg had a huge, uh, several pallets of clay that was hard as a rock that nobody wanted to buy that was discontinued. And they sent it to me for a really big discount. They gave me a lot of like free slip that was like not perfect. Um, so it was just an enormous, enormous amount of labor, labor of love. And this is something I like to present when I share with scientists, because um, I do a lot of like art science lectures and I've worked with scientists to talk about the similarities between artists and scientists that I've noticed. Um, both artists and scientists are searching for intrinsic truths. What is true? Why does it matter? How can we move society forward? Um, there's a continuous feedback loop between learning and doing. Um, we're going, we're both going to the field to get information and coming back to our studios to process that information. Um, and both artists and scientists approach problems with the same open-mindedness and inquisitiveness. And I thought that was really, really interesting. What makes us different, like my colleague and I, uh, Dr. Nissa Silbiger, 
uh, scientists are very methodical and they like to follow the rules and artists don't. So for her, it's really good that she's like, we have to do it this way. And I'm like, no, 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 like, let's turn it upside down. Like, there's no rules. And she'll freak out and, or she'll have, she'll help rope me in when I'm thinking of like really, really up in the air, she can help organize and create things in a really methodical way. And her research is so amazing and what it is that they're doing. Um, scientists have to be really consistent with their research. Everything has to be documented exactly on time in order for it to be credible. So I learned a lot working with scientists. Um, and then after COVID lifted, I was able to actually go out to Nissa's research site in beautiful French Polynesia, Marea, um, where everyone thinks she's on vacation, but really what she's doing is with her team of students and, and lab assistants, she's processing hundreds of thousands of gallons of water to sample different water um, sources on the reef. And what she's trying to investigate is the cause of reef decline due to nutrients that seep through the water table and flow out onto the reefs. So in French Polynesia, um, there's a lot of pineapple farms, a lot of like hotels that things go into the water table. And what they do is they cause the reefs to have algae blooms and it suffocates them. So these are just some different snapshots of the location. Um, there's Nissa on the far right. She's basically gathering water all day, every day. They do this 24 hours a day, three in the morning, four in the morning, five in the morning. They're exhausted. They have to carry all of this water back to LA to process. So um, even though they're in like the most beautiful place in the world, uh, it's it's a lot of hard work. And I give those, those uh, scientists a lot of credit for what it is that they do. Um, so while I was out there, since this was kind of on the back end and I was supposed to go there first, I was really uh, watching these scientists work so hard to basically protect and conserve something that's in decline. Corals are in decline, not just because of nutrients, but because of global warming, because of the warming seas, ocean acidification. And it's sort of like, I believe that 80% of the world's corals have been affected by this. There's bleaching events that happen. So it's almost like watching sand slip through your fingers, right? So as these scientists were sampling water and rushing and hustling to try to do all this work, um, I was doing a lot of these sand prints with the molds of uh, Moran corals that I cast and watching the ocean kind of wash them away. So this was a bit of a, a performance piece. And there are uh, different, different types of beaches. Um, the tides also in this region of the world, because it's so close to the equator, don't come in very far and they don't go out very far. They're very, they're called micro tides, which is much different from here, which we have red tide that comes all the way up. Uh, so it's a great place to do some sort of experimental work like this. All of these are uh, on the sand or cast molds from textures that I collected from the island. And then, of course, I got to see a real thriving coral reef for the first time, uh, scuba diving in French Polynesia. So the coral reefs in the Pacific are much different from the coral reefs here. It's like a football field of corals. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And um, these ecosystems are in decline. And, and it's something that I was just talking to them earlier about uh, the barrier of entry to like see these these types of reefs. It's expensive. It's, it's costly. Some people can't even go down that far because they have ear issues. So I was really thinking about how can I bring these ecosystems up to the surface so that people can see them and appreciate them. Uh, and so after that trip and that project, I really started focusing a lot on uh, marine conservation and coral reefs. So up until this point, I was doing a lot of this casting in a manual way, uh, using silicone molds to cast directly from the environment, leaves and bark or coral skeletons. Um, and so I wanted to learn how to speed up my process. I'm also very fascinated by tools and technology. Ceramics is ancient technology. Ceramics is mankind's first tool. It was the first cup or bowl or plate or storage, right? It was a weapon. It was a, a flint stone. So these are all, this is sort of like an ancient technology. And I've been utilizing digital fabrication processes to create installations and sculptures. So I did a workshop at a residency called Anderson Ranch, uh, where I learned how to digitally fabricate molds using a uh, 3D technology like Rhino, which is a 3D modeling software, and um, using a CNC machine, which is a computer numeric tool, which basically cuts uh, into an object in a, a reductive process to carve a texture or a form. And for me, I was using these to make different types of modular tiling systems with the goal of building installations that either wrap around architectural forms or standalone murals on the wall to start. So here's kind of an example of some of the mold boxes I built to make ceramic high relief and low relief tiling systems. And then I applied this technology to a project I did at Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden. This piece is called Garden Portals. Uh, it was the result of a Night Arts Challenge Award and a community grant from the city of Miami-Dade, 
where I was also partnering with Fairchild, going into the garden, casting different types of leaves and textures and silicone molds, and then producing these different modules by pressing clay into these uh, digitally fabricated mold boxes uh, to create that sort of tessellating uh, natural pattern. So after creating all of the tiles, all of the forms, um, I hosted a series of workshops with the community at different outdoor spaces. This was also during COVID, which is just crazy that I did the two largest projects with social practice during a pandemic, but um, it really gave people something to do. And so a lot of these workshops, I was able to hold at Miami Beach Botanical Garden, at the Redlands, um, at Fairchild Outdoors. And so people got to be outside uh, making ceramics in beautiful tropical spaces, which was really rewarding. So throughout these workshops, people were instructed to press clay into the molds. And this time, instead of sticking them onto a, a framework, I brought them back into my studio, um, cleaned them up, fired them, arranged them on the tiles to create that mural, Garden Portals. Uh, and then it hung in the Tropical Conservatory at Fairchild for uh, several months on display for the community to come back and together. So this really made me interested in thinking about um, art in public places, right? So. Quite often we see public art and we don't get a say in what goes up. Like, why did someone choose like a bright red noodle, like in the middle of a parking lot? Like, that's weird. Um, the idea of people contributing to art in public places and being engaged in civic spaces and having a say over what goes into it or being a part of it, it creates stakeholders in the community and creates investment. Um, and so that's what this project was. Um, this was for the Fairchild community, for the Miami community. Um, where they could visit Fairchild and, and say, oh, like, that's my leaf, or, oh, I made that part, or I know how that was made. And they get a little bit more invested uh, in the work, and also it draws them a little bit more into the message behind it, which is uh, conserving our environment and our appreciating and caring for our ecosystems. Uh, here's another project I did using digital fabrication. So this is the really great thing about using digital fabrication for molds, is that you can design it rather than just making it, whereas before I was doing folded paper, or having to make the prototype by hand and then kind of creating it afterwards. There was a little bit of a, a mystery as to how it was gonna turn out. Uh, now with digital fabrication, I can design it in a, in a software and I can get an idea, like maybe I want the circle to be bigger. Maybe I want it to be an oval. Maybe I want it to be you know, a different size tile or form. So here's an example of using that method uh, to create a circular form. And here's a detail of that. This was actually exhibited at the Frank in Pembroke Pines last year, year, year and a half ago, I believe. Uh, and here you can see different types of tropical fruits. There's uh, lemons, there's apples. Uh, I started integrating more of like a Florida um, sort of like landscape into the work. Uh, this was another piece that recently exhibited last year at Green Space Miami this, uh, as a recipient of the Green Space Grant. Uh, where it was a smaller work, I invited the community to help me create um, mostly the Green Space family and, and the affiliates, uh, where it's this piece is called Three Rivers. So the base of these tiles are a uh, coral reef, a uh, 3D modeled landscape. So if you look very closely, the, the tiles themselves are a topographical landscape of an underwater uh, reef. And then on top of it is different types of fruits and leaves and shells uh, and actually 3D modeled uh, corals. And so uh, with this project, I really wanted to talk about the different types of agriculture that's in Little Haiti. Uh, in the 1800s, it was called Lemon City, Lemon City Bowls Town, and it was uh, citrus groves. And so a lot of these farmers moved down in the late 1800s and farmed the land and planted avocado trees and lychee trees and, and different types of citrus plants. Um, and then when the real estate boom happened in Florida in the early 1900s, all of those people had to leave um, because they were bought out or removed. And But if you look around Little Haiti and even around Miami, you'll still see avocado trees, you'll see citrus trees. Uh, and so it's sort of the evidence uh, left behind by these agricultural communities. And that's what uh, this work is inspired by. A little bit more about the digital fabrication, getting more technical, um, using 3D modeled scans. I was sourcing from uh, databases, from different types of scientists that I had met that use photogrammetry, which is when you use photographs to create a 3D model. Um, and then flattening them or designing them for bas relief tile modules, such as this one on the right, um, to create different types of ceramic works. And these are both press molded tiles as well as slip cast tiles. The one on the right is a CNC pattern, which is a carved uh, prototype. And the one on the left is a 3D printed model, which is an additive prototype. So these are two different processes for uh, mold making. Here's a little bit more uh, of some of my process. Um, taking 3D scans of different types of corals. So 
in the middle there with my hand holding that form, that's a 3D printed Pacific coral reef. And what I found so interesting about the photogrammetry and the scanning is like, now there's no more extraction, right? Like you can't take silicone and put it on top of a live coral, right? One that's it's underwater and two, they're endangered and they wouldn't like that very much. So starting to think about how can I bring these ecosystems to the surface uh, in as accurate way as possible uh, without harming them or, or causing any extraction. And so uh, digital fabrication and 3D printing became um, something that I, I was really, really interested in. I also started to learn how to do my own photogrammetry scans. Um, so on the top right, when I did the residency with NISA in French Polynesia, um, I talked to several scientists and students that were using photogrammetry in their research. Um, and basically it involves using a camera and photographing something from 360 degrees, and then a software will stitch it together. So on the bottom left and the right are different types of uh, photogrammetry scans. The one on the right uses the photography as the texture. The one on the left is just the form itself. Um, and so I've been sourcing a lot of the sculptures, both the tiles as well as 3D modeled sculptures from 3D scans of live corals. And I source these from different partnerships that I formed from institutions, scientific beta databases, and personal scuba excursions. Um, that is not me flying over that amazing field of coral. That is a, a rose coral that's on, off the coast of Tahiti. The reason this coral looks so beautiful is because it's 150 feet down. And with my open water certification, I usually only go 50 feet down. So there's just so many amazing wonders like just below the surface that a lot of people can't get to. And that's probably why they look like that. Um, just some more under the hood of photogrammetry and what that looks like. I use a software called Agisoft Metashape, which is one of the photogrammetry uh, softwares that you can use. There are many different ones you can experiment with. And here are all these little sort of window pane panels. That's where my camera was situated. Um, I've taken it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to document different types of Roman architectural structures, um, as well as coral skeletons themselves. So all of these are different types of 3D models that I've generated using uh, photogrammetry. Um, these are all from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, 3D scans. Uh, this is usually the base of my research. So I've 3D printed sections of this. Um, I've started to use projections. Um, I've experimented in the NFT world a little bit. Uh, so this is sort of the research behind the ceramics that I do. Uh, it's another part of my practice, but I think it looks pretty cool. <laughs> um, let's see. That doesn't let me, okay. So here you can see the nice thing about capturing things, photogrammetry is you can see things from three dimensions, right? And then with different types of software, if you get really good and you practice with things like Fusion or Unity, you can actually build out virtual worlds. This is how they build a lot of video games uh, using photogrammetry. You can modify things, you can cut things, you can put them on molds. So for me, it's part of the research, but as well as investigating uh, different ways to kind of redux or modify these different themes throughout history which I find super interesting. Um, you can also scan with your iPhone. If you have a LiDAR scanner on your phone, this is a, a program called Scanniverse. Uh, the newer iPhones, you can actually do 3D scans just with your phone. You don't have to use any software. It's very, very easy. So this is a 3D scan of one of my sculptures I did just with my iPhone. It took me five minutes. Um, so it's something that's becoming easier and easier to do. And I think it's going to be more and more integrated as uh, we move forward with the internet and web three and the metaverse uh, about creating things that are both tangible um, digitally as well as physically. Um, here's a project that I did in 2021 using 3D scans of coral. This is for No Vacancy on Miami Beach. Um, it won the Juror's Choice Award. It is a series of 3D modeled uh, bas relief or high relief tiles based on a coral reef landscape. Um, Here's a little bit behind the process using a 3D modeled uh, coral reef landscape of a reef in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands that was decimated by a hurricane in 2018. And uh, it, they've been enshrined in this sort of totemesque sculpture. It's a mixed media sculpture. And here's a little bit more about the process using a CNC. That blue object is a CNC piece of foam. Uh, that creates the prototype. And then from the molds, uh, I create the different ceramic tiles um, using a, usually the 3D scans are very, have a lot of undercuts. They have to sort of be unwrapped and then modeled onto the tiles to create the forms. Um, use, I've also been integrating uh, 3D modeled coral elements into my geometric sculptures. And these are some of the experiments. 
Um, a recent uh, project at the Jewish Museum of South Florida. These are Montipora Postlipora porcelain lamps. So I've been really investigating, uh, embracing ceramics form and function and the idea of design uh, to create obviously cladding systems and sculptural tile systems for the wall, but also uh, lighting elements and using different types of uh, material, ceramic material like porcelain, which is translucent and the pieces will actually glow. So I've been developing different types of uh, sconces as well as hanging chandelier forms uh, and people really, really seem to respond to it. There's, we're in a really interesting time in contemporary art where now where art and design are beginning to blur. Whereas before um, it was kind of a no-no. Like I, when I was at Art Basel proper, the convention center, and I saw like furniture. So I think that whereas before uh, this idea of, of function was sort of separate from contemporary art, it, it's begun to become more integrated. And I don't know if it's because of COVID or the age of the internet that people are really starting to explore materials and handmade objects again. It's great for me. It's great for any artist that loves to make work with their hands. Um, but this has been really enjoyable to kind of uh, think about light uh, as part of sculpture. And my most recent project and the last project I will show you is uh, a piece I did for uh, Mad Art Space, which is a Dania Beach ad agency that's developing an immersive museum. Uh, I wanted to showcase the 3D scans that I've been collecting during scuba diving expeditions. So this is a recent scan I did of Kerry Sport Reef uh, with the Coral Restoration Foundation in December uh, with photogrammetry. So these are some freshly out planted staghorn coral, uh, which is sort of a baseline for coral restoration. There's a lot of organizations now doing coral restoration, especially in the Florida Keys, uh, where they're actually transplanting coral and allowing them to grow as a way to kind of help mitigate the destruction. Um, so on the right hand side, you can see that is a staghorn coral already bleaching, right? But they kind of grow like a thicket. On the right hand side is a data point cloud generated from the photogrammetry. So it's a really interesting way to kind of like bring these ecosystems to people without having to uh, scuba dive or go below the surface. Um, and this project I presented both as an NFT, uh, as well as a projection work with uh, uh, an animation of this 3D coral, these 3D models spinning on a dish as well to create an immersive sort of digital sculpture, uh, as well as um, an NFT, uh, which is a whole other, <laughs> I'm happy to answer questions about NFTs, but that's a whole other way of engaging people on the internet and gamifying the work that you do. Um, and this is the uh, the NFT. This is an animation of uh, the 3D scan of the coral, the coral reef in Kerry Sport. And it looks like this. Um, this is my first NFT. So I did a crypto, good for me. Um, I've learned a lot about NFTs as a way to gamify and engage people. And what I find so interesting about it is, um, you know, a, a, an installation, you can experience an installation or experience a work of art for one time in a specific space, but in the digital world, things live on. Uh, so I find it uh, very interesting to kind of play in that in that world. And that is my presentation. I don't know if there's any questions I can answer, but I'm more than happy to do so at this time. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. That was wonderful. Um... I have a question. We'll open it up. If anyone has a question, you can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself if you like. Um, you mentioned a couple times the research that you do. Can you talk, uh, expand on how much time you spend doing research and what is that like? Um, I guess like research for me is like finding inspiration. And at this point and at this level and what it is that I do, the research is very specifically tailored to um, residency applications to grants applications um, to public art proposals. So the way that I conduct my research these days is it kind of compounds. So obviously you're in school, you're researching artists that inspire you, you're writing about your work. Um, and so every time a new opportunity comes up, I'll research what that opportunity is about. If it sounds like it fits, uh, I will uh, usually go on the internet. I will look at other art movements that have happened I also have a, a practice in the field uh, working with scientists over the last few years where I'm able to go out to these different sites. Um, I consider the scanning as part of my research. Uh, I learn about what people do. I do a lot of um, visits to labs. I invite people to my studio. So all of these sort of things, both 
you know, researching on the computer or reading different types of books or going out into the field and doing scans or speaking with scientists or doing studio visits uh, and writing application proposals that all kind of like folds into my my research. And then my work is more of like the physical objects that are produced, either um, sculptural ceramic designs as well as uh, projected pieces or even now recently an NFT. So that was part of my research as well, so understanding NFTs. Does that make sense? Yes. So, <laughs> so you had mentioned also, I was interested, you had, um, you, you were making the handmade ceramics and then you transitioned to techno. What was the spark again for the transition to using more technology? Um, in 2018, uh, I, I did a workshop with Anderson Ranch, which is an amazing artist residency. If anyone gets a chance to go, uh, I was able to afford it through a presidential scholarship through Anderson Ranch, which you can apply for financial aid, uh, as well as a an artist access grant, which is offered quarterly by Miami-Dade County. They'll give you up to $1,500. Um, so between those two things, I was able to subsidize a workshop. And I did a two-week workshop with one of my ceramic heroes that I admired for years. His name's Del Harrow. He teaches at the University of Colorado and he has an architecture background. So he taught us how to use Rhino and different types of 3D modeling for CNC. And for me, that was a way to speed up my production process in ceramics, as well as to imagine things in a modular way, like those tiling forms. And then I started integrating the tiling forms with the CNC. And after I visited my colleague in French Polynesia and I observed the 3D scanning that she was doing um, or that her students were doing, uh, I wanted to learn a little bit more about that. So I started applying those uh, 3D scans first from institutions and scientific databases um, into my mold making through 3D modeling and digital fabrication for CNC and 3D printing. And then now recently I've been taking my own scans and getting kind of lost in that uh, digital world, which is a, a little bit of a different, it's like sculpting with data in a weird way, because with photogrammetry, you get a point cloud. So it's like this big cloud and you can kind of see an image in there. And then you go through and you like sort of delete all the points that you don't want. And then it forms a mesh. And then you can kind of create objects and select uh, what is included in the scan. So it's like a weird little side project that I've been sort of integrating into my physical sculpture. Wonderful. Well, thank you for this amazing talk. I really appreciate your time uh, and this this insight into your practice. And um, I wanted to just say thank you to everyone for joining us today, unless anyone has any other questions. I had a quick question. Oh, please. wonderful. Meg, please. Hi. Um, I come from a very serious scuba diving family from the 70s. My father was one of the first people I no in South Florida that was diving and he belonged to a club and they all dove really week every weekend if they weren't traveling off of Hollywood Beach pre, pre, mostly off of what they call Liberty Street now it was Lee Street are you familiar with the reefs anymore do they exist anymore are you have do you have an interest in um making any artworks that preserve what's happening to them and their condition now yeah, I think um, that's been the interesting thing about uh, doing the scanning of the restoration sites. So Carrie's Sport Reef in the Florida Keys was once a giant Elkhorn thicket in the 70s. It was like a huge, it was a national treasure of the Keys. And over the last 40 years, it's basically completely gone. It is completely gone. And so that's one of the, the sites called Mission Iconic Reefs, which are seven reef sites in the Florida Keys that are funded by NOAA, which is the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Institute that kind of unites all these restoration initiatives and provides them with funding to basically restore these seven key sites. Um, Florida Keys are really serious about their corals. Fort Lauderdale also, there's been a, there's a lot of initiatives for coral restoration. I've only been diving the last couple of years, so I'm like a baby diver and this world is new to me, though I grew up on the coast of Florida snorkeling all the time and I've seen the difference just being here my whole life and seeing the decline over the last like 30 something years. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm really interested in capturing moments in time on the reef, including this time right now and to see how it will change over time. So is Cary is Cary the same uh Cary Port the same as Penny Camp? It's nearby, but it's a different reef. You can type if you research Cary Sport Reef, C A R Y S F O R T, Cary Sport Reef, um you'll see it's one of the famous examples of like devastation because it was once like 
a destination where people would go to see like these massive like elkhorn corals that was like amazing and then it just started to decline and it's just mostly oh. gone a lot of like stony tissue disease and ocean acidification have really affected the corals so what's cool about the restoration is that they're actually breeding more resilient corals and they if you've ever seen a coral restoration farm it's like these trees at least in south florida they're different all over the world but they're they basically if you've ever propagated like a cactus or a succulent you can like break off a little sprig or an arm and you tie it onto this tree and it will actually regrow a new coral and so they classify each genus of each coral and the more the most resilient ones they will plant onto the reef um which i think coming from a plant sort of like ecology botany sort of like research that to me was super interesting i'm really fascinated by the idea of like how people and nature interact and mm -hmm. and systems and and how we kind of like can cultivate and i really believe that's going to be the future of reefs that are reefs that are cultivated by people and tended to just like our landscaping here thank you i'm just very sentimental about the broward county the hollywood beaches and the hollywood reefs so thank you for that information thank you Lauren, I have one more question. Um, you were, I was lucky enough to see your work at the Bakehouse with, during the pandemic in, in the gallery. Can you, and you, can you talk about um, how you worked with the community during that project? Um, so we're talking about Future Pacific, right? Yes, the big yes. Mm -hmm. So um, that was difficult because uh, Nissa had got Nissa had funding from NSF for a project. I got a private grant as well as a private donation um, to basically realize this massive thing, and they were considering postponing it. But I was worried that some of the funding was going to go away, so I just pushed through. And so we had to basically do groups of ten people, socially distanced. It was like it took way, way, way longer than it should, um, but it created sort of these intimate experiences. So like. 10 people could be let in at a time. Maybe there were like three or four people per table kind of spread out. And what I noticed was so interesting is everybody who had that experience where they were having this collective shared experience of like pressing clay into these molds and then carrying their molds over and sticking them onto the forms. They were talking about, oh, like, like what you were saying, Meg, like, oh my, I come from a scuba diving family. This is what I remember. Or, oh, like I did, I did scuba diving this one time and I saw this. And so everyone was just kind of like talking about it. Uh, and it sparked a lot of really interesting conversations. So we we created a video and it's on my website. You can watch it. It's called Future Pacific by a local filmmaker here, Shireen Rahini, who's an incredible underwater diver and filmmaker. Um, and it really captures the spirit of that community effort to make the work, which really was the work. The outcome was spectacular, but really it was the community effort, the collective effort that was the artwork, right? So um, I've always tried, whenever I get these grants, I always try to budget for a film and video because video, I mean, what Shireen does is like total activism and video lives on. It's it's immersive. It's it, it transcends time. It transcends space. It lives on forever. It can travel around the world. Everything we experience is video. Like even on Instagram, nobody looks at still images anymore. It's all motion video. So um, I think like that's kind of important for those of you who are doing like any sort of like participatory work or social practice work that um, you think about how it's preserved in time, especially because um, the pro my projects are ephemeral. Um, so that that was really rewarding. Also, the other bonus of working with the community is is I cannot do that by myself. I can't do these projects on that scale on my own for that amount of money. So for me, it's sort of like helping me solve a problem, like how can I build something really, really large? And it gives people an opportunity to interact, engage, uh, try a material. It puts them into a system where they can't fail. So that's kind of been my, my trick with these installations is there's molds. So all you have to do is just show up. You don't have to have any art skills whatsoever. You just press clay into a mold and you stick it onto a frame and like together, like you can't fail. And so I think it breaks down barriers between you know, you go to a museum, there's like artist and audience, right? Object and viewer. And so now it's sort of, I'm really interested in kind of breaking down those barriers uh, between observer and object and really integrating people into um, art making processes. As a ceramicist, as an educator, um, it works really well with these types of installations. Wonderful. How many people were involved in the project? Did I hear you right? When you, did you say 1500? It was 15,000 pounds of clay because uh -huh. it was it was like seven tons in total. And I think with the event bright, we estimated about 300 people came through over a month and a half, including the the volunteers, the high school volunteers, staff, people I hired. Um, 
It was crazy. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, I have a question here from Carrington. Um, has a transition from a more physical practice to incorporating a digital way of imagining your work been difficult? And in what ways is it rewarding? Good question. It's a great question. Um, I think like I get computer burnout. That for me has been really hard because I, I spend a lot of time, obviously at this level of what I do, I'm doing a lot of emailing, I'm doing a lot of writing, like my, my writing practice is, I would say 50 to 60, sometimes even 70% of my time is on the computer writing, um, grants, applications, writing Instagram posts, managing a website. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm doing well, but I'm not well enough to hire someone yet, you know, for those types of things. So the digital thing can be really fun, but I feel the burnout of staring at a screen. And that to me is, is the most difficult part. Um, on the flip side, uh, I can, I can sort of like, uh, it, it's so, I just find it so fascinating to play with things in 3d and kind of make them come to life in the real world. So taking these different models and then putting them onto a physical object and then 3d printing them, for example. And then I kind of like the, for me, the best part is like seeing it come to life in clay, right? So 3d printing is sort of, it's a bioplastic, it's PLA. Um, there's different types of foams or materials that you can use. And it's really the way of the future about how we bring these things from virtual to a physical world. Um, but to turn them into a material, it's something that was previously impossible with ceramics. Like you look at like marble statues or friezes or reliefs in, in Europe, and they were meticulously chiseled by ateliers of people who learned from generations. Now we can fabricate them with just one person using technology. And it, it and for me, like uh, there's no for me, like the ultimate would be like a classical sort of style, like bas relief arch covered in like high fidelity coral reef replicas. Like I've never seen anything like that before. Like that would be, I think we're so mesmerized by sort of like the European sort of like craftsmanship of the Renaissance. And, and that's all the things we study. A lot of things we study in art history in America anyway, but um, the craftsmanship and the effort and the time that it takes to do something like that um, is amazing to me. So I think that's kind of like how I play between the two. I try to take breaks from the digital stuff and do and do physical handmade things, but um, those are that's kind of a, a, a balance that I do struggle with, especially lately. Thank you. Um, I have a let me see another question. Um, Carolyn says, "Amazing work, thank you, Lauren. You're amazing." Um, I have a question. When you are utilizing the public to participate, how much of the work in chance and how much are you making aesthetic choices? Another good question. Uh, it's very collaborative. So I always equate it to like being a mom at a birthday party where you have to like, you set everything up, like the tablecloth and the thing and the stuff and like, here are the molds. But for the most part, I don't have control over where they put the pieces. I don't have control over how they place the pieces. But the way I control it is I have a, I have molds, so I know how the forms are going to look. And then there's one unified structure. So if you think of like the work of Louise Nevelson, right, who's a, a, a very famous sculptor, she has these shadow boxes that are all white or all black, and they have all these disparate elements. But because the color unifies it all, it looks like a cohesive whole. So for me, with the unfired works, it's the same principle. It's just different types of design elements that are similar, but different that all homogenize into one unit, which is why I wrap them around these architectural forms because they're they're recognizable as, as geometry, they're recognizable as fixtures, right? And that these forms kind of uh, homogeneously unify the whole thing. So I have some control, I have control, but I also don't have control. And for me, I like that. Like, I don't wanna know exactly where every little thing goes. That's not important to me. It's more about like the unit, the whole. And with the fired pieces, with the ceramic tiles, I'm actually taking all those elements that people do and selecting them and cleaning them and moving them around. So they're helping me produce a piece of the project and that they become part of my design element. Um, ultimately, it's labor, right? It's it's I'm using labor as a as a design as a design element. Um, I'm just lucky that people like ceramics because <laughs> it is so fun. Like you just come in, you're like a kid at a birthday party. Like you get your clay, you get to press the thing and you're dirty and you're talking with your friends and you're having this experience and then you go home and you don't have to worry about it. And then you come back to the gallery and ta-da, it's like this amazing work of art that you were a part of. So um, again, I'm really interested in systems. And for me, that is a system. What are you working on next? 
My next and upcoming project, I just received a contract for Art in Public Places to do a large sculptural wall installation for MSC Cruise Line at the new port of Miami Terminal that's going up on the causeway that's being built right now. Um, and it's a, uh, a large uh, installation of sculptural wall ceramics based on 3D modeled coral reef ecosystems. So it will be complete in about a year and a half. Um, it's going to be my largest, most ambitious work to date. Um, and I'm super excited about it. So um, I've been, I also have another project that I'm working on through Art in Public Places that'll be happening right after that for a park in South Miami Dade, where I'm going to be basically creating these tiling, uh, like bas relief tiling systems that wrap around sort of sculptural furniture. And that will be at the Chuck Pezholt Park, a community park and library in South Miami Dade. So those really large installations, though they were unfired and ephemeral, sort of served as proof of concept for permanent works of art. And my experiences dealing with grants, dealing with accounting, managing people, ordering supplies, all kind of like led me into uh, art in public places and the amount of production that it takes. It's not something for everybody. You have to really enjoy uh, production and like large scale sort of production and being more of a producer, sort of leading back to my residency in China, understanding production. Um, but it is, it's, it's a way to execute really large scale, uh, impressive works of art. It's just... It's a different way of making art because now you're using contractors. Now you're using permits. Now you're working with architects. Now you have GCs. Now you're, you know, you're, you're understanding construction, which is something that's um, completely new to me. I've only done these sort of proof of concepts through unfired clay. Uh, so that those are going to be my next projects um, that will be happening over the next 18 months. Wow. That sounds exciting. Well, congratulations on that. That sounds amazing. So, well, I look forward to seeing those in completion and thank you again. Uh, it was wonderful uh, meeting you. I, we've met before, but it was wonderful to chat with you now about your work and um, all that you've been doing. And I look forward to um, our paths crossing another time. So thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great evening. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night.